So in the first month post-transplant, we all know that there is a deep immune deficiency because of reduced numbers of lymphocytes and because of a reduced repertoire and proliferation capacity of T cells. And this uh, causes an increased probability of severe infections, especially if antigen-specific T cells are lacking. Our main enemies are adenovirus, especially in children, cytomegalovirus, especially in adults, but also EBV and BK virus. All these viruses can persist in the body. So the incidence of ADV in adults is between 5 and 20 percent, in children between 20 and 47 percent. Mortality rates between 18 and 26 percent, 26 percent have been reported and in disseminated disease up to 61 percent. Risk factors are well known, GVHD, lymphocytopenia or immunosuppressive therapy. This is the cumulative incidence of ADV reactivation in our own Tübingen pediatric patients. I mainly focus on children because I'm a pedi pediatrician, but this program also includes adults. As you can see, uh, we have uh, incidence of about 20% independent from the type of donor, match sibling donor, match unrelated donor or haplodonor. So our first question was, are antigen-specific T cells of donor origin really necessary to clear, by example, an ADV infection post-transplant? Uh, therefore, we established the de detection of ADV-specific T cells with intracellular interferon gamma staining. This is the mock control. Here you can see uh, the really positive uh, gamma interferon positive T cells. This is a positive control. And this slide is to show you that ADV-specific T cells are indeed a precondition to prevent from life-threatening infections. Patients who died from ADV had absolutely no specific T cells detectable, whereas patients who survived an ADV infection had a frequency of specific T cells detectable, which was comparable to that from healthy donors. And our question, our next question was, is a transfer of specific T cells from the donor to the, those patients possible? So our next aim was to isolate and to purify virus-specific T cells from the donor and to infuse them in the patient without inducing graft versus host disease. So why don't we infuse all peripheral mononuclear cells of the donor? Because we have a certain frequency of alloreactive T cells, which would cause severe graft versus host disease, sometimes severe, sometimes not so severe, but the risk of GVHD is definitely given. And only a very low frequency of T cells is really virus specific and only T these T cells can clear the infection. So our uh, principle is to transfuse only those cells and to <coughs> discard all other cell types in order to avoid any GVHD in that case. So there are three principal methods for generation of specific T cells. First option is to do a culture and repetitive stimulation with, which needs uh, several months. Here we can get a, a combination of CD4 and CD8 cells. Second option is to use the cytokine secretion assay. Here we also get a combination of cells. Third option is to use tetramere staining. Here we get only CD8 positive cells. I want to focus on this option, the cytokine secretion assay. And uh, this is how we do the adoptive transfer of antigen specific donor T cells. We need about 500 ml of donor blood or an unstimulated leukapheresis. We do an ex vivo stimulation with the appropriate antigen overnight. Specific T cells can be recognized by their gamma interferon production. And with the help of the gamma interferon secretion assay, we can isolate this small 
population of cells. We end up with a combination of CD8 and CD4 specific T cells, only very low amounts, about five to 10,000 per kg body weight. And these cells can directly infused into the patient. Uh, again, these are the two steps of the isolation. First, ex vivo stimulation, by example, with adeno hexane protein. Second, use of the gamma interferon secretion assay. For this purpose, uh, a cytokine catch reagent is used. This is a bi-specific antibody construct with one specificity against CD45 and another specificity against gamma interferon. So all cells will be stained, but only if the cell uh, secretes gamma interferon, this gamma interferon will be immobilized on the cell surface. And this can be, this interferon then can be detected by a secondary antibody and uh, magnetic microbeads. So what is the phenotype of isolated T-cells? We need naive T-cells, central memory, and also effector memory cells. And indeed, in our preparations, we find naive cells, we find uh, T-cell, uh, uh, central memory T-cells, which have the capacity for self-renewal, and we also have effector memory T-cells, which are the effectors of the of the T-cell response. And this is the example for the first clinical application of those cells in nine patients who were transplanted from matched unrelated donors. All these patients had no positive uh, specific T-cells detectable prior to the adoptive transfer. In five out of nine patients, we could see an in vivo proliferation of the transferred T cells. And these patients were indeed able to reduce their ADV load or to get completely rid of their ADV load. In patients in whom no in vivo proliferation occurred, nothing happened. These patients could not fight against their ADV load. In the meantime, we have uh, uh, treated more than 35 patients. Uh, the median age was 16, 0 0.5 years, but also 71 years. So this includes also, analysis includes also adults. Uh, several di typical diagnoses uh, um, which need a stem cell transplantation were included. We had um, one third of patients who received uh, uh, graphs from matched donors and two-thirds who received graphs from mismatched donors. And this is a very important slide. Uh, some patients had GVHD present prior to or at T-cell transfer, but after the T-cell transfer almost no GVHD occurred which was attributed to the transfer itself. Only three patients developed additional grade 1 to 2 GVHD. So this is the number of uh, specific ADV T cells we infused. As you can see, the mean number was only 3,500. This is a ridiculous small amount of cells. Uh, and these cells do only act if they proliferate then in the body, in the patient. And this happened in two-thirds of the patients. Two-thirds had an in vivo proliferation, one-third had not. You can see here the patients with in vivo proliferation. Again, none of the patients had specific T cells detectable prior to transfer. And these patients here showed a nice in vivo proliferation of the cells. And exactly these patients then were able to reduce their viral load or to get completely rid of the viral load. Here you can see patients with an in vivo T cell response all could clear the, their ADV load, the blue line, whereas only as uh, small portions of patients with no in vivo T cells response could fight against their ADV um, 
disease. This is our approach to adenovirus infection. If we have uh, reactivation or infection, we first would use uh, cytophobia for treatment. If we have an increasing viral load despite cytophobia treatment, we indeed would use an adoptive T cell transfer. Okay, so now let's switch to CMV infection. This is an example for uh, adoptive treatment uh, with uh, PP65 specific T cells in patients who failed, in whom failed uh, uh, antiviral treatment. And those patients we infused a little bit more T cells, about 20,000 per kg body weight. And again, you can see this graph here. Uh, all patients again had no specific T cells detectable prior to transfer. After transfer, we could see a proliferation in 12 out of 16 patients and a total of 15 out of 18 evaluable patients indeed could reduce the viral load or could completely eradicate the CMV uh, load and the CMV infection. And the third uh, example is EBV. Here you can see the patient characteristics who received an EBV-specific T-cell transfer. We have a cohort of 10 patients, again, children and adults. We, uh, eight patients had a PTLD, two had refractory viremia. CNS involvement was present in three patients. Eight patients had received rituximab prior to that and were refractory. We infused um, 5,800 T cells per kg body weight with a purity of about 60%. And uh, so, sorry, these are res the results. Again, eight out of 10 patients showed an in vivo proliferation. Seven out of 10 could get rid of the EBV. Uh, viremia, three patients failed and unfortunately died. In this patient, additionally, we could observe that EBV associated lymphomas in the liver disappeared completely after the um, um, uh, transfer of specific T cells. So the conclusions are adoptive transfer of virus specific T cells. Uh, is possible after the secretion assay, we can isolate a very small amount, but active T cells. In vivo proliferation does not occur always. We think in about two thirds of the patients. If yes, we can reduce ABV, EBV, or CMV load, that is very likely. And especially no side effects occurred. And we have a very low risk of GVHD. So now I would like to talk a little bit about our current, current manufacturing practice. At the moment we switch from handmade to a fully automated production. Why is that necessary? Because the handmade production is very time consuming and a very intensive procedure. You, know, you need very experienced technicians and the most important thing, the presence of, presence of a technician is needed at night, which is uh, very uncomfortable, of course. With this automated device, you can perform an almost completely automatic production. This reduces the duration of the whole procedure to less than 24 hours. And I would like to show you our experience with this uh, automated device called Prodigy. I have to admit that it is an almost fully automated device, so a few steps have to be done by hand. We have to install the tubing set, we have to connect buffer, reagents and cells, we need medium uh, washing buffer, saline for infusion and peptide cocktail catch reagents and beads. Now this needs one to two hours and then uh, the Prodigy is ready for running. All other steps are automated and these steps include washing procedures, application of the peptide cocktail during the night, stimulation for four hours, 
then incubation with a catch reagent at 4 degrees, then the secretion phase of interferon gamma at 37 degrees, then cooling down and washing the isolation run on the column, and afterwards the cell product is definitely ready for injection. Here you can see a comparison between the manual procedure and the automatic procedure, technical skills needed for this are high for the prodigies, uh, the technical skills needed are low, hands on time here 8 hours, here 1 to 2 hours, overall time 23 hours for the manual procedure and 16 hours for the automated procedure. So which antigens do we use at the moment? For ADV, we use a mixture of overlapping oligopeptides which cover the complete sequence of the hexone protein. For CMV, we do the same, also a mixture of overlapping oligopeptides which cover the complete sequence of the PP65 protein. And for EBV, we use a mixture of 43 HLA1 and HLA2 restricted peptides. Uh, derived from LMP or eBNA, and this mixture covers almost all HLA types or alleles uh, expressed by donors and patients. The enrichment of virus antigen specific T cells with the prodigy was done now in 24 patients. Most patients received a single specific T cell preparation, but uh, several patients also need, uh, receive the double specific preparation or even a triple specific pre uh, uh, preparation and we call these multi-specific T cells. However, this is not one T cells with three specificities, but it is a mixture of three T cell subtypes, each of the subtype with one specificity against a different antigen. Okay, this is an example for a flow cytometry analysis prior to a prodigy separation. Here you can see a frequency of 0.1%. Afterwards, we end up with more than 80% um, um, specificity after separation. And this is an example for CMV specific T cells <coughs> prior to the enrichment 0.1%. Uh, afterwards, we have a uh, um, purity of more than 75%. These are the results of the prodigy enrichment. Uh, we start with an absolute number of mononuclear cells of 1,000 million. Afterwards, we end up with only 1 million uh, target cells. The percentage of uh, specific T cells is 0.2%. Prior to the separation procedure, afterwards we reach more than 80% specificity and we got about 500,000 T cells, absolute numbers of 500,000 specific T cells. What is the response to the transferred T cells, which were prodigy, prodigy produced? Uh, the response was uh, defined as a reduction of the vir virus load for at least one log after four weeks. So after four weeks, we could see a response in 36 patients, as 36 percent of the patients, whereas in 28 percent of the patients, nothing happened. After eight weeks, we had a response in 52% of the patients, whereas 11% of the patients remained without response. And finally, I would like to show you um, our, our um, new kit in the block, the adaptive transfer of BK virus-specific T cells in case of severe hemorrhagic cystitis. We all know this is a severe problem. Mostly hemorrhagic cystitis is not life-threatening, but patients suffer a lot from this uh, severe uh, complication. We have treated four patients. In the meantime, two patients received only BK specific T cells to other patients received a cocktail of multi-specific T cells. We infused between 5,000 and 20,000 cells per kg body weight 
And we could observe an in vivo proliferation of the BK cells in three out of four patients. Here you can see an example of the course, of the treatment course in one patient. This patient had a really severe hemorrhagic cystitis. Of course, BK virus was detectable in urine, but also in blood. This is the course of the BK load in blood. Despite uh, cytophobia treatment, he could not uh, eliminate his uh, BK virus load, and then he received uh, specific T cells twice, you see these two stars here, and after the BK, BK by, uh, sorry, BK specific uh, T cells, after this transfer, indeed he could eliminate his BK, BK virus load and could also um, uh, get rid of, of his uh, cystitis. So the final conclusions are. Um, the current indications for adoptive transfer of virus-specific T cells is in our hands an increasing copy number despite antiviral treatment. Multi-specific preparations are possible, triple-specific or even four specificities. Since we really observed very low side effects, almost nothing I have to say, an early preemptive or even a prophylactic use might be reasonable uh, in our opinion. So that's the end of my talk. I finally want to thank all my colleagues who contributed to this work, especially Tobias Feuchtinger, who did a lot of this, uh, of this work. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you.